we're going to take our attention now over to Dr. Maurice McNaughton, who will lead a discussion um, with the three representatives from those sectors, from private sector, from government, from development, and academia. So, Dr. McNaughton, do tell us who you have with you this evening, and take it away. Uh, great. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Finn. And uh, good evening, everyone. It's, uh, uh, it's really a pleasure for me, and, and uh, I would suggest a privilege um, to be participating in this launch of the Caribbean edition of the GDB, as my colleagues, um, Professor Rao and Dr. Osuno, and the researchers, we've been at this study for the better part of a year. And uh, so it's, it's great to be at the point where we are not only uh, disseminating the findings, but engaging in a kind of conversation around what does this mean and how do we move forward um, on this. And uh, again, it's a privilege to be able to have the opportunity to engage with a, a quite distinguished panel of uh, what I would suggest as thought leaders in different domains, as you said, Finn. Uh, we, we thought it was important to get varied perspectives on what this GDB study and, and the findings and the insights, what do they mean for industry? What do they mean for the public sector? And what do they mean for the overall regional development agenda? Um, so what we sought to do was to convene uh, a panel with a quite high level of representation uh, from government, policymakers, business executives, and, and academics. Um, to discuss the findings of the GDB study and some of the implications for both business and, and, and policy. Uh, so we have on today's panel, we have uh, Mr. Patrick Hilton. Uh, Patrick is no stranger to anyone in the Caribbean. Uh, he's president and group, group CEO of the NCB Financial Group. And uh, under his leadership, NCB has become the, the largest and most profitable uh, financial institution in Jamaica, and uh, is it the top five in the English and Spanish-speaking Caribbean, Patrick? I think the top five. That, that's correct. Thank you. And, and All right. th thanks for, for the welcome and thanks for the opportunity to participate. All right. And then, and then we have Ms. Joaquin Murray. Uh, Joaquin is the Chief Technical uh, Director of the Ministry of Science, Energy and Technology in Jamaica. Uh, Joaquin is a lawyer with expertise in the areas of telecoms, electronic commerce, intellectual property rights, cybersecurity, and data protection. So that makes Joaquin uh, quite unusual um, in her coverage. Um, currently vice chair of the executive council of the Caribbean Telecommunications Union. Uh, great to have you here, Joaquin, to give us the Thank policy you. perspective. Thank you for the invitation. All right, and then we have Prof. Abdul Abdul Kadri. Um, uh, Abdul is a colleague of ours. Uh, I would say Abdul, an alumni of um, academia at uh, the University of West Indies and the Mona campus, but currently coordinator of the Statistics and Social Development Unit of uh, UN ECLAC. Um, so Abdul is based in Port of Spain, and he leads the Regional Commission's technical assistance to Caribbean countries on statistical capacity building and also the follow-up and review of the 2030 agenda for the SDGs. So again, bringing quite an important perspective um, in relation to the development agenda. So as well as the academic perspective. So welcome, Abdul. It's always a pleasure to, uh, to accept your invitation whenever there is a call for me to participate at our MSBM uh, event. So I'm really glad to be part of this discussion and I look forward to, to it. Thank Great. you for the invitation. Again. Great, so, so thank you all, each of you for joining us. Um, so you'd have heard from my good colleague, Silvana, who, and, and Silvana, I don't know if you're still online, but I mean, you really took on the massive task of coordinating this global initiative as, as you've all heard, the GDB covers 109 countries. And, and really you gave us a perspective on the, the rationale, the structure and the methodological approach. My, my colleague, Susanna uh, Russell, who uh, pretty much led the Caribbean study working with the great team of researchers that you've heard from. 
um, gave us some insights on the Caribbean findings. And, and of course, you heard from the researchers themselves um, in a discussion facilitated by uh, Prof. Rao. Um, but you all know the old adage, right? You can't manage what you can't measure. So the GDB as a measurement framework is, is only as important as the thing that it sets out to measure, which is the data ecosystem. And you would have heard from the previous presentations that it is quite comprehensive in terms of looking at uh, all four dimensions of that data ecosystem, governance, capabilities, um, availability, and use and impact. Um, but, but obviously, it is only important if data is important. So I want to start with that question to each of the panelists, um, just to give us your own perspective um, on the importance of data from your particular vantage point, whether it's from industry, academia, development, public sector. But why is data important to business? Let me start with you, Patrick. Sure, and, and thanks, thanks for the question. You know, when I think about it, to my mind, data is particularly important because data provides insights, right? Insights to solve problems, insights to facilitate convenience, insights to facilitate innovation, um, create to create value across several domains, as we have seen right around the world, um, to create wealth not for individuals, for institutions, for, for, for economies, for societies, for countries. And, and we have seen several examples. And I speak to a couple of them in a minute, right? But my own peculiar interest, or, or I should say, very focused interest in data and the power of data started in 2010. Um, because in my journey as CEO of NCB Group, I had identified, we're going through a period where we're having some challenges with revenue growth. And you know, every time I would try to understand from the team, the leadership team, what was behind it, I kept getting anecdotal explanations, right? You know, the economy, you know, um, inflation, you know, devaluation, you know, all the various um, excuses and explanations. And so I said, you know, I came across this quote. I think it was by Dr. Edward Deming, who said that in God we trust, and for everyone else, bring me the data. And so I started using it consistently. And then I came across this other quote which said that anything I cannot measure does not exist. I can't remember, I think it's Microsoft or one of those companies was, was using that, right? And the, the purpose of continuously pushing that quotation was to try to, to instill a change in people's attitude towards you know bringing moving from a culture of which was anecdotal to one which was more driven by by data right to be more insights driven and you know it was interesting we started doing an assessment focused on sales to, to address the revenue challenge and what we found was that none of the things that were being mentioned anecdotally were responsible for what we were experiencing but what was happening is that sales productivity was low and from in, in terms of individual sales performance. And so it enabled us to develop a program focused on improving sales productivity, right? And in less than a year, we're able to improve sales productivity by over 300% in most instances. And interestingly, this is a period that coincided with NCB's rise to dominance um, in, in, in the financial sector and as a, a company trading on the stock exchange. In other words, the, the period of dominance growth, the, 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 the elevated trajectory started in 2010, shortly after we engaged in that exercise. And I think it had, it had a big part of, of a big contribution to what we experienced because the organization started to focus now on being more insights driven. Right, so, so, so we're able to, to change culture from an anecdotal culture to an insights driven culture. And we're able to see significant benefits, not just for NCB, but for its customers, for its staff, for the society, for the people who we serve, 
for the persons who were interacting with us in terms of building their businesses to, to serve our economy. Right? And as I said, I was doing some research and I saw where the McKinsey Global Institute mentioned that um, they did a study which shows that countries that embrace data um, sharing for finance can see GDP gains between one and 5% between now and, and 2030, which, which is quite significant. And I also saw we're in the Netherlands, um, they're able to conduct their census by using, by pulling data from existing sources rather than doing the traditional survey method. And in so doing, they've been able to reduce the cost of the census by 99%. Right? So that I think tangibly demonstrates why data is important and the power of data. Excellent, thank you for that, Patrick. And, and your, your last comment allows me to segue to Abdul, um, who has been advocating for the use of big data to augment um, the official statistics in countries. Um, so Abdul, give us a, talk to us a little bit about the importance you see and the value of data to the development agenda, and, 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 and particularly the, the point Patrick just made about using data to either augment or substitute for traditional methods of uh, statistical data collection and reporting. Yeah, thank you again, uh, Maurice. Uh, this is quite interesting. Um, I, I like the, the, the practical uh, experience that Mr. Hilton alluded to or uh, shared with us. And uh, I, I'm going to start with a quote, which is actually uh, quite addressing the issue of data for development. And this is from the Independent uh, Expert Advisory Group on Data Revolution for Sustainable Development, the IEAD. You may have come across uh, the, their publication titled A Word That Counts. And uh, this is a, public, a, a, a quote I like so much, so you may have heard me quote it or uh, cite it in one of my writings. And it goes, that data are the lifeblood of decision making and the raw material for, for accountability. Without high quality data providing the right information on the right things at the right time, designing, monitoring, and evaluating effective policies becomes almost impossible. So you could remove policies and say substitute business decision and it would quite aptly describe what Mr. Hilton just uh, described. So in terms of development, in the development era, we are all familiar with the MDGs, right? The Millennium Development Goals. It wasn't long ago. Uh, that, that ended in 20, it started in 2000 and ended in 2015. And at the conclusion of the MDGs, it was in particularly a very successful program, even though there was a lot of uh, excitement around it when it was introduced in the year 2000. But one of the failings of the MDG was the lack of data. The data were just not there to measure uh, progress. And there wasn't a well-developed mechanism to do that. Now, that's not the case with the SDGs that succeeded uh, the MDGs. And one of those, uh, with that realization, there was a lot of interest in data. And that was what led to this uh, initiative of data for sustainable development, the data revolution for sustainable development. So realizing the importance of data in development is as good as realizing the importance of data in policies. We have national development plans. And this is an area that I'm passionate about, that I've worked in. And until recently, you pick up a national development plan. You have a lot of fancy goals and you can't find how it's going to be measured mm. or how the targets that are written there were uh, arrived at. You know, how do you know that you could achieve 2% growth or 5% growth annually? What's the evidence? Now, so if we operate in, a, in an environment where we do not rely on data to make decisions or to plan, then we are planning to fail or we are not planning at all. And that shows the importance of data, why we need data. And for my own, if I could uh, also have uh, talk a little bit about my own personal uh, experience. 
I have always known the value of data because I taught statistics and econometrics, so I work with data every now and then. But I was always curious why we couldn't get data on things I know we have data on or that we should have data on. And that's actually what led me to ECLAC. You know, that was uh, that fascination. And it so happens that the opportunity uh, 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 occurred for me to join the international development uh, uh, arena. And when I got to ECLAC, I realized that oh, I was quite, I was in the in, in a situation of, uh, of lack of adequate knowledge. You know, I didn't know that it's so complex. And it's so complex because we live in an environment where there are many uh, challenges that surround you know, the production, the dissemination, the analysis and dissemination of data, which uh, hopefully we will have an opportunity to, uh, to uh, discuss further on. But data is, uh, the data are very critical and we need them for decision making. And when you are making decision without them, then you are planning to fail or not planning at all. And I think uh, with uh, the, the examples that Mr. Hilton has provided already tonight, we have very good uh, uh, indication that in the business environment, data is critical. With what I've said about what the UN has done in terms of data revolution for, uh, for sustainable development, we know that data are very critical. And I'm sure that uh, Ms. Murray will have her own uh, experience to share as well. Thank you. All right, thank you for that, Abdul. And so, Joaquin, we come to the public sector. Of course, you'd have heard Patrick speaking about uh, almost the extent to which data as a private good was able to elevate um, NCB, or one of the pillars on which NCB uh, sort of um, uh, launched its ascendancy to become a top five regional financial institution. Can you talk a little bit uh, from the vantage point of the public sector on the importance and or value of data, either as a public good or as a resource that can drive public sector efficiency. What, what, what's the, the view from your vantage? So th thank you, Maurice. Um, I think, the, I think um, Mr. Hilton and Professor would have really gone into a lot of what I probably would have said and um, Professor in particular in respect of the government and how government treats with data and uses data would have been pointed and would have said um, um, a lot of what I would have said, but I will still repeat because, you know, I think, I think everybody knows that governments create and collect and manage a vast amount of data relative to anyone else or any other entity. And um, in the context of that collection and creation and management, um, the use of the data for government clearly is with a view to assisting the government in making sound decisions. Um, it, data is critical in, 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 in conducting evidence-based policy making. And of course, um, the delivery of public services efficiently and effectively. The role of government in the context of the lives of, 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 of its people is really around making decisions that will benefit um, the society as a whole. And so the extent to which government collects data and then in turn, or creates, and then in turn manages and uses that data to make decisions that are sound and grounded in, 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 in evidence or grounded in statistics is important. Um, I heard Professor talk about the fact that, you know, the, you, 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 you have these national development um, plans and we have one, Vision 2030, and you wonder sometimes where it is that, what was the baseline, first of all, you know, and where, where, how did we know that we, how do we know that we are where we are? And then um, more instructively, uh, more, in, uh, more importantly, I suppose, the fact that at the end of the day, there are some um, strategic um, objectives that we've set, set ourselves, our goals, and we've set no, no baseline as to, deter, to determine how it is that we're going to or, or no, um, 
indicator to determine how it is that we're going to achieve what we, how we will know that we will achieve or have achieved what we're, we, set, we set out to achieve. And that is particularly, you know, from where I sit in the Ministry of Science, Energy and Technology, one of the areas that we find that data is extremely, um, uh, the, the availability of data is, 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 is very low, is in the area of, it's in the sciences. To the point now where we have to be sitting and working very closely with um, UNESCO to do develop a gap analysis um, to determine where we are um, as we are poised to implement the science and technology, science, technology and innovation policy, which was recently um, 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 passed in parliament. And so we find ourselves having to step back a little bit. We have a policy that needs to be implemented, but we need to understand where we are because without understanding where we are, certainly we, it's gonna be difficult to implement. And as, 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 as Mr. Hilton indicated, you know, if, if you don't have a measurement and, and if you don't know what it is that you're measuring, then what is the point exactly? You know, so I think for, for government, um, public sector bodies across the GOJ, um, the, the, the importance of data is critical in ensuring that we deliver public services efficiently and effectively with the, we would say, few top tax dollars that we have. Um, um, I think we know what our concerns and challenges are as a government and how we have to manage that tax dollar. And it, it's critical that we use data to inform the decisions that we take. Yeah. Okay, great. great. Of, of course, I just make, just make one last point and that's in the collection and the creation and the management. But then on the flip side, we have our role in sharing that data as well mm. because we create so much, collect so much and manage so much. We have a, a, a critical role to play in ensuring, in ensuring that government um, shares the data to enable the transparency and participation um, um, in the business of government by the society. And of course, to enable individuals to, to create um, innovative solution to challenges that we face as a country. So, so while it is that we are using for our own purpose, for our own purposes, it's important too as well for the government to share and to push that data out so that others can utilize it to solve some of Jamaica's problems. Yeah, great. Thanks, Joaquin. And you, you guys are giving me such very useful segues into my follow-on round of questions. And incidentally, for the audience, uh, we're going to have about maybe two rounds of questions, and then we're going to invite some uh, questions from the audience. And, and so hopefully, if you've been paying keen attention um, throughout, you may have some comments or questions to make. Um, but let me ask you this, um, Patrick. I mean, that from what you've said, obviously data is an important competitive private asset um, for business. A lot of our discussions this evening, we have spoken about data for the public good. Um, do you think that the private sector has A, an interest or B, a responsibility to play an active role in the development of the public data ecosystem by whatever means, either by contributing anonymized data or by providing expertise or infrastructure. Do you think that's a role that the private sector should uh, take on board and take seriously? Uh, sorry, absolutely. Um, the private sector has such a role. When we think about it. If you look at our economy, the eco ecosystem, right? Uh, private sector and public sector work together in many instances to provide critical services, right? If, if we take the financial sector, you know, uh, we're in the business of loans and so on, which people require to run their, develop their businesses, to, to operate in the society, to purchase assets, to, you know, buy homes, motor vehicles and so on. And, and so there is a commonality of interest. There, there, there is an alignment between the goals of the private sector and the goals of the government, which is in, in the form of the development of the economy, development of the society, development of our people, um, you know, raising the level of wealth within our society, right? Improving living conditions and so on, all of these things, um, there, there's a commonality of interest. The, the better the society does, the better business does. So there's that alignment. And at the end of the day, um, you know, 
given the, as we have discussed previously, the importance of Beto, the, 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 the power of Beto to, 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 to affect people's lives and businesses, the power of data to be used to transform people's lives and businesses, the power of data to be used to create greater convenience, to create value, to create innovation within the society. Then I think it is self-evident that collaboration between government and private sector is what would result in the best use of data. Now, of course, there are some limitations. There are some constraints, right? Uh, we want to have a system that is interoperable um, in terms of how it works, but we have to have respect for privacy. Mm -hmm. And that is something that can be managed. It, has, it is being managed in many countries, right? If you look at a country like Estonia, where they have, um, you know, they, they, they have a very comprehensive um, framework of collaboration between government and private sector in terms of how they manage data. At the same time, there's, significant, there's great transparency right with how people's data is used who accesses it and so on you can know who accesses your data there are rules around who can access it on what basis permission and access um you know protocols have been established all of these things i think are enablers right and facilitators of the collaboration and the value creation that can come from initiatives of this nature i'll give you an example several years ago we were talking earlier about the dominican republic I visited the Dominican Republic and had a discussion with some banks and they were sharing with me that there's a particular journey, customer journey, uh, as we describe it, right? Which involves uh, the purchase of a motor vehicle, right? Another, that's one major customer journey for many customers or consumers. Another one would be the purchase of a home, right? Uh, because it, it, it is a significant transaction in the life of a lot of people. And in the Dominican Republic, they were sharing with me that they had gotten to a stage, and I don't know where it is now because this was some years ago, where they had a collaboration going between the banks, the motor vehicle dealers, the equivalent of our tax authorities who do the licensing, the insurance companies, where a person could come into the bank on a particular day, they'll set up these special days, they could apply for a car loan, they could have it licensed, they could have it insured, right? And they could select and drive out their car the same day, right? Now, all of this came from them having a desire, right? To leverage data, to leverage collaboration, right? To, to have an integrated effort to facilitate greater convenience and efficiency for the consumer, right? And there, I could, if we had time, I could give you several examples of what we have seen across the world in terms of how um, you know, public and private institutions have come together to facilitate um, these types of transactions. We have seen, for example, where credit cards get turned around from application to, to, to the person getting the, the, the credit card in, in a matter of just a few hours, right? Um, all kinds of things that can be facilitated. So I think that there is there is big opportunity, right? I think there. Is, I think it is. I don't think it is a question of whether or not there should be collaboration. I think it is an imperative that there should be this collaboration, because I think that society can benefit so tremendously from it that we really have an obligation to society to ensure that it it happens. No, that's, uh, I, yeah, I agree. That's incredibly important. And I mean, to back to you, Joaquin, you, you made the point earlier that government, governments collect and are the custodians of an enormous amount of data that has great value. In, in a sense, when we used to look at the whole open data ecosystem, we were saying that government sits at the top of the data food chain, right? Because you collect and hold data about infrastructure, you know, roads, um, buildings, land, um, data about citizens, uh, we're just about to start census 2022, data about economic activity, trade, um, revenue collection, tax revenue collection, just an enormous amount of data. One of the things that the GDB report suggests is that in the Caribbean, our governments are not doing quite enough to make data freely available for access and use by 
you know, individuals, by the private sector, by entrepreneurs. Um, what's your take on that? And I know we have an open data policy in Jamaica, but the truth is, it's still difficult for people to get access to timely current um, public sector data. Now, I know one of the things that you have to balance is the your responsibility to the privacy of the individual's data versus the potential value opportunity of access. But um, talk a little bit about how you balance that and how we can get to a state where a lot of that gold that you have hoarded in the public sector can be made available um, to yeah. All right. So, So thank you for that question, Maurice. I personally think that the government of Jamaica has been doing over the last several years or taking the steps rather over the last several years to balance that or to strike the balance between um, ensuring protection where protection is required and releasing data. I think we have with our policies and our policy framework and our legislative framework uh, a, a, a suite of policies and legislation that now in 2022, interestingly, sets us, um, sets us up as a government to, to ensure that there is data governance and an ecosystem that can enable um, not only the sharing of data in a, in a way that is secure and or protects um, Privacy, And if we think about what we have as a suite of legislation, we, we've, all, we've had for some time, um, our, first, our first Cyber Crimes Act was in 2010, um, reviewed in 2015, and now being reviewed again. Um, in 2020, we would have passed our Data Protection Act, and you know, um, participants would have heard about that. And even though that piece of legislation is not yet in force, as we seek to establish the Office of the Information Commissioner, that legislation is just awaiting that process. Um, additionally, we would have last year, and it was said earlier in one of the panel discussions that we, we cabinet approved our open data policy. And at the end of last year, there was also an approval by a cabinet of a data sharing policy, um, though specific to um, government, right? So I, th and then of course, we've always had for some time now our Access to Information Act. Some might criticize it um, because there are exemptions, but I think collectively we have a, a, a suite of policy and legislation that seeks to enable um, the collection, use, um, the sharing of data now. And we're poised, I think, to move into the next several years, um, um, building on, on the policies and building on the legislation that we have. So I think we've, we've struck the appropriate balance between the need to protect personal data and sensitive personal data and to enable um, the use of data for economic value and opportunity. If we look at, for example, our data protection legislation, it doesn't say that data ought not to, personal data ought not to be collected. What it seeks to do is to define the parameters of use and to, of course, of course, impose obligations on users or processors of the data, both in the public sector and the private sector, around how it is that data, personal data, if collected, is to be processed um, and how it is to be used, what is legal in the context of the collection and how it is that you can share. Um, and what um, technical and organizational uh, measures need to be in place as a processor of personal data to ensure the protection of the data that you collect from citizens. Bearing in mind that at the end of the day, data, the data is not the processor's data, but the, the, it is the individual's data. And I think what we are, where we're moving to, and what we need to establish across both public and private sector um, and in the minds of our citizens is this, this thing called trust. It really, in my mind, boils down to trust. And if it is that persons can, can um, enter an organization 
um, know that no more than what is required is going to be collected in respect of them, data about them, than is necessary. And there is transparency um, with that, you know, that institution or person um, in how it is going to be used and whom it is going to be shared with and where it is likely to end up. And if there are breaches, I, you will you will tell me. That is when we begin to realize that persons will be less concerned about releasing their information than they are now. I think it really is about trust. With respect to how the public sector um, utilizes and shares data in the context of open government data now, what we, what, what the drive that we're on, and we've been on this on this road a, a, a long time because the access to information unit, for example, has always been an advocate of open sharing. They've always advocated that as public sector bodies, we should just share the data to the extent that we can. Once there are not confidential um, parameters, once it's not um, it doesn't um, infringe anyone's intellectual property rights, for example, or um, breach privacy, then we should be freely and willingly sharing without needing to be coerced. And that is a culture that we have to develop in the, in the public sector, where we move away from um, you know, keeping the data to our chest um, and more freely releasing. Uh, and I think both the open data policy, as we seek to implement that, as well as our data sharing policy, um, as we implement that one as well, will be moving us as a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a government in the direction of more openly making available that data which we legally can. Sorry, I was unmuted. Yeah, no, thanks for that, Joaquin. Great points there. Um, this is such a fascinating conversation. I could go on and on. I, my, my, my tech people are prodding me that we are um, running out of time, but uh, we've just begun to scratch the surface of this. Uh, so I hope you, you guys don't mind us going on for a little bit longer. Um, I wanted to ask you, Abdul, because it's come up a couple of times. Um, in, in our discussions. And it's a term that we've increasingly begun to throw around, this whole idea of data as a public good, um, digital public goods. It's something that we heard the UN Secretary General and various agencies like ECLAC strongly advocating for this idea of digital public goods as a kind of uh, infrastructure, if you will, digital infrastructure on which we can build a range of um, services. Um, can you just briefly explain what this idea of digital public goods is and where, as a region, we can capitalize on, on this as an emerging opportunity? Thank you, Maurice. Uh, the concept of digital public good actually uh, arose from the, the concept of public good, generally in economics, where, you know, uh, we all know what public services are. So if we have a good that is considered to be or is classified to be public, we'll have uh, certain characteristics. Uh, for example, uh, traffic light. You know, if you are using traffic light, you don't pay for it, but uh, you are free to use it and your use of it does not prevent someone else from using it. So it becomes public good. So something that will be more in line with what we are talking about now will be, uh, let's look at the situation of uh, COVID-19, where it's now something that we live with and we've adjusted to or we're still adjusting to. If we get a bulletin from the Minister of Health, for example, uh, Minister of Health and Wellness in the case of Jamaica, maybe provide, and that was, and it may still be the case, but at the peak of, uh, COVID-19, almost every day you get a bulletin or, or maybe uh, sometimes, multiple times in a day, telling you the situation of uh, COVID infection and things like that, or advising people what to do, that this thing is still out there. That's public information. 
now. If it is released digitally, you know, it's to serve some good and it's public and you have access to it, it could be in digital form. Your use of it does not prevent somebody else from benefiting from that information. So that relates quite well with, with uh, what we could consider to be a digital public good. But more broadly, that's a very specific example, but more broadly, the concept has to do with how we use things like uh, open source software, open data, open standards, open concept, open uh, content that you have, or open artificial intelligence that is available to anybody to use and it's publicly available, but under some very specific uh, uh, minor conditions that you have to satisfy. The issue of privacy, as uh, Ms. Murray mentioned, uh, it's very critical when it comes to uh, it being a public good. It has to meet the condition of the standards of the international standards of privacy, of data privacy, such that you don't release uh, somebody's information in the case of open data, for example, if it contains uh, confidentiality. And it has to also uh, have the condition that it's, it does no harm, right? So if it meets the privacy conditions and it's not causing harm to anybody, it's not for the purpose of harming someone. For example, the issue of uh, fake news, that could be released open to anybody but it could be for the purpose of causing harm. It may not be factual, but it has a very uh, particular purpose. So that would not qualify to be a, a digital public good. Now, if all these uh, items and applications that we uh, I listed and some of that meet that privacy as well as do no harm uh, conditions, then they will be considered as public good. But they also have to abide by certain legislation. You know, there may be conditions or regulations surrounding the specific content that is being shared. So we have to make sure that those conditions are satisfied. But those conditions are not meant to limit the distribution or reach, but to make sure that the content uh, uh, they are of high quality and of benefit in order to make it a public good, right? Uh, so that's, uh, the, 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 the broadly the concept. Mm -hmm. And um, within the United Nations and other development partners, there are, uh, there's a lot of interest in making sure that we have uh, the, the digital public good is, is uh, publicized and is actually enhanced. And this goes along the way of what I mentioned earlier about the data uh, revolution for sustainable development. The UN is really pushing uh, the, the, the notion of data, that data has to be used for public good and has to be used to inform decisions. And when you have uh, applications or you have content that could be open or that could be a public uh, use, then we should promote access to it and those uh, applications or those uh, whatever we enhance access to the data like uh, Ms. Murray mentioned also, will be uh, quite critical. Yeah. But getting there is not going to be easy. You know, we have to, there are things that we have to uh, put in place and there are things that we have to uh, look forward to. The issue of capacity is a challenge in the Caribbean and uh, better in some countries than other. Uh, for example, you may talk about uh, Jamaica, their capacity is very limited. But when you talk about starting in the Caribbean, some countries will say, you know, that's like talking of, uh, 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 that's like a dream. So when we talk about capacity is relative, but there are uh, statistical offices in the Caribbean that they are so thinly uh, staffed. And uh, with respect to technical capacity, that it's really, there are some things that are just impossible for them to do. So we have to look broadly at the issue of capacity development. And in terms of that, there has to be a lot of focus on data literacy for uh, digital public good to be something that will, uh, that, that, that would be of benefit more broadly, because there is still a lot of, there is still limited data literacy uh, in the region. And uh, people 
may even have custody of data, like uh, in the government offices, administrative data, for example. They don't, they are not in the business of collecting data, but they do generate data just by doing their normal job. But many of those who handle the data have no idea of what, uh, what standards are with respect to handling data. So when we now talk about data, uh, the, uh, the digital public good, and we are now advocating for people to make whatever data they have available. Somebody who does not understand that date of birth of someone being released with their name is a violation of privacy. They just say, oh, you need that data, I have it. Here it is. So we need that awareness about data literacy to let people know about uh, what you could share, what you cannot share, under what condition, and the expertise to actually do the issue because with respect to open data, uh, as an example, the uh, concern has always been the violation of privacy. Right? So if you are unable to hide public, uh, hide uh, what is considered to be confidential information, or identifiable information, you know, either by just hiding the column or just taking that whole column out. It could be as simple as, you know, somebody who has a basic knowledge of Excel to do that. So we need to improve the knowledge about data literacy more broadly and the expertise at an advanced level where we are able to deal with that. And uh, the knowledge of standards as well, you know, what you could share, what you cannot share under what condition, the issue of legislation and policy. And I think that has been mentioned in several sessions today where we uh, data could be used for public good and that is what the digital public good is all about but if the legislation specifically prohibits you from sharing data then there's nothing you can do and there are countries in which there is such uh, uh, prohibition in law so that needs to be addressed so you may have situations in which they are not uh, they, they are not categorically authorized to share data, which you know some traditional national NSOs would hide behind that to say we well, are not authorized to share data, although they are not prevented, prohibited from sharing data, but they will tell you I'm not authorized to share data. But there are a few where they are actually prohibited from sharing data. Right. So those inconsistencies have to be looked into, and the legislation needs to be improved. And the issue of uh, and those are being dealt with at various levels. We are, you know, involving data literacy, uh, looking at the review of legislation and advising countries on transitioning from one status to add to, to another. But those areas that have not yet been really uh, worked on will be in terms of advocacy, where there has to be a clear advocacy for this, for, uh, for digital public goods. And the investment that is needed to actually advance uh, the, 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 the notion of data being public good or digital uh, sources being public good, and for that investment to actually promote the advocacy. Uh, so there are quite a number of things I've mentioned there, but mm -hmm. hopefully we will have one or two things that uh, we as individuals or in our own respect, uh, in our own organization or whatever that we can hold on to and implement in order to contribute to the, uh, the, this concept of digital public good. Okay, great. Thanks for that. Um, uh, I would almost say thesis, uh, Bill, but um, uh, sort of, yeah. I think it's an important concept and uh, obviously the approach that we take to that in the Caribbean has to be a regional approach. There's really little point in individual countries each doing their own thing in, in pursuit of this notion of digital public goods. Um, Fane, are you, you know, do we have any questions from the audience? I mean, I, I, I am I'm being quite selfish because there's so much I want to talk to this panel about, but um, let me pause here and see if we have any uh, questions from the audience, Fane. Well, I'll go ahead and prompt the audience uh, beginning using the question and answer box. Uh, to post any comments, any questions you have, not just from Dr. McNaughton's segment of the proceedings this afternoon, but also from any part of the uh, of, of everything that you've heard, the overviews from Dr. Russell, Dr. Fumega, and of course the researchers are still with us. If you'd like to pick apart anything that they said and, and ask uh, for extra clarification. We did have Lindell 
who mentioned um, in response to Ms. Marie's um, uh, point about trust, you know, uh, validating that and endorsing that idea um, about the need for public trust so that they can buy into this um, notion of sharing their data. Um, so, so far we, we have that in the Q&A, so please participants feel free to go ahead and use the Q&A box to, um, to put some of your thoughts down for the, any of the panelists to, to answer. And in the meantime, while we wait for that, oh, we have Daniel, Mr. Daniel Charles, asking how can we set anonymized data standards across the region? So speaking, Dr. McNaughton, of that idea of, of approaching everything regionally and this idea of sort of standardizing uh, what we do, how can we set anonymized data standards across the region? Mm, it's a good question. Um, is that a policy question, uh, Joaquin, for you or Abdul? Is this something that more for the regional bodies like ECLAC to look at facilitating. So anyone of you want to respond to that? I didn't see your hand up, I will have yielded to you. Uh, just uh, very briefly, uh, this is actually an issue that ECLAC has uh, taken on uh, about three years ago now, I think we did a, a, a workshop on data anonymization uh, for the uh, Caribbean, uh, but mainly with the national statistical offices. And even at ECLAC, we understand that the, the, the technical expertise is not well developed within ECLAC, mm. and even less so within the NSO. So this is an area that's in, that it's uh, highly needed, but we have very limited skills. and. Uh, the there is a, a project that is actually running off, uh, which is called the PRAS project, the project uh, project for regional advancement of statistics in the Caribbean, being uh, funded by the uh, by the Canadian government and implemented by Statistics Canada. Now, uh, ECLAC sits on the project advisory board. Uh, I represent ECLAC on that board, and it's uh, it's one of those things that we recommended to Statistics Canada, that there should be training on that. Uh, we partner with them. We've uh, done some uh, webinars, but what we really need, it's probably uh, some training course, you know, which will not be just a two or three day workshop or maybe in a two, three weeks where you could actually have people to be involved in these, uh, the, the actual work of data anonymization. And that we really enhance the discussion about setting a regional standard, because even setting a regional standard now will not do much in terms of the practical uh, application or relevance of it, because we don't have the expertise. There are no uh, widely available uh, statisticians or data scientists with that expertise to anonymize data. And that's one of the key uh, constraints that the NSOs have in releasing data. Um, uh, so, yeah, thank you. Okay, okay. Um, any, any other questions, Fane, uh, from the floor? Uh, you're muted, Fane. We have another contribution from Lindell asking, would there be interest in working with and including the National ICT Associations as part of the training to build that capacity? open to, to anyone uh, on the floor who would like to just just following up, following on because I think the two questions are kind of related um, but one of the things that we recognize is um, the need for that anonymization and as, as I spoke about the legislation and our policies before almost all of them speak to the need for technical and organizational measures to include encryption and so on to protect personal data in particular, for example. But as we speak about open data and the need to also ensure the, the, the protection that um, Prof would have referred to, whether it's with respect to personal information or stuff that is con confidential or whether it's defense related or security related, you know. Um, one of the things that we've identified um, in both the open data policy as well as our data sharing policy is the need for the development of common standards 
for applicability across all our public sectors, um, public sector entities. And so in both those um, um, policies, there is going to be an initiative or has to be initiatives for the development of standards. Um, in, in Jamaica, we, we consider that um, for ICT authority, now EGOV Jamaica, which is the implementing um, arm of, 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 of implementing, um, well, the agency responsible for implementation of ICT policies. But um, it, is, it will have a key role to play, certainly in Jamaica, in facilitating um, that kind of, or those kinds of um, development of standards for wide application across government, but it's something that we do recognize that is required so that everybody is working at minimum on the same level and applying the same standards as it relates to, to data collection, data management, um, and, and data use. Uh, Finn, you're muted. I keep forgetting that I'm muting myself to ensure any of my background noise doesn't interfere with the, the responses. Um, we have Linda adding to that question about national ICT associations saying, because these technical persons and practitioners would be in a key position to guide businesses or industry in terms of their readiness to support wider government efforts and adopting standards at a practical level. So that offer of of a ready partner in national ICT associations working with other stakeholders um, to, to pursue this. And we have McDonald uh, asking, what are some recommendations to encourage data governance within SMEs as private and public bodies embrace data culture? So we'll put that to anyone um, on the floor. Perhaps um, Mr. Hilton might want to start with that one. Well, you know, I... <laughs> I look at it from the, the perspective of, um, you know, a, a business person. And always my focus is on, you know, what is the, the, the value that we're creating? Because it, well, it's important to understand, you know, all the, 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 the issues and the constraints and so on. I think it's important for us to start to deliver some runs on the board, to use a cricketing analogy, mm. to deliver some, some, some value in terms of tangible, um, you know, tangible things that can be done and developed. So, so that, because what I find when people start to see the value inherent in something, then they tend to coalesce more around it and support it, right? You tend to have less resistance. Um, it, 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 you're, you're going to always have the naysayers and those you know, in society, but then social media and so on, we'll talk, you know, try and raise all kinds of issues about privacy and so on, which is important, but sometimes misguided, right? And, but when people see the value inherent in some of these things, then I think it helps to overcome some of that, some of that resistance that, that we tend to, 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 to find. And, you know, so anything that is of value to SMEs, Right in terms of the needs of SMEs to help them to develop as businesses, right? There are several initiatives that across data sets that can be leveraged to, to, to help SMEs. Um, they have several challenges in terms of access to information, data to inform um, business decisions that they need to make. And, and I think that if we can find a way as a society. One of the things that I've been sitting here and saying to myself, what next? You know, so we have this information, we, we have this, this analysis, this assessment, right? What next? How do we convert it into tangibility? How do we convert it into value, right? What is the, the goal? What is the aspiration? Within what time frame, right? Who are we going to assist? How is it going to assist them? And, and if we look at SMEs and say, what are some of the needs of SMEs, right? whether from a financial perspective in terms of the bureaucracy that they have to deal with in, you know, in making returns, in you know, preparing financial statements and getting access to certain types of information or access to certain services. How can we leverage um, this study? How can the, the Mona School and, and you know, all the, 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 the persons who are supporting this engage government, engage society, right? In, in creating 
you know, starting to create value. You know, one, 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 one thought I have, for example, is how do we, how do we, you know, determine what is a big audacious goal, right? What, what I like to call the aspiration, right? Because my own experience is that uh, yeah, Mr. Murthy from Founder of Interest has put it beautifully and he said that an aspiration is a main fuel for progress. Right, it converts ordinary people into extraordinary achievers. Right, so what is a big goal? And then how do, who do we get involved? There was a Mona School of Business get involved with the government, with certain government agencies, with certain private sector agencies, come together, you know, determine a, a few. Don't, 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 set to, to, don't set something that is unrealistic, right? Maybe a stretch, but reasonable. And, and start even as we continue the process of study, even as a container process of analysis, start to deliver value to our people so that the government see the value inherent in it, the people see the value inherent in it, the institutions see the value inherent in it. Whether they're small, medium, or large enterprise, enterprises and are willing to come on board and support it. And so, so, you know, I like to, to be very focused on the value of proposition. I like to be very focused on, you know, delivering value, delivering something that is tangible, that people can walk away. That's for, by, for example, I gave earlier the, example, the, the, the experience in the dumb rep, which as we can see is, you know, on the basis of the study is more advanced in certain areas. Can you imagine, I don't know how many persons here have gone into an institution, financial institution in Jamaica or in, in the, the Caribbean generally to get financing for a motor vehicle. But I don't know who would be able to go in there and walk out from application to driving out the car in the same day. Right? What it is, you go into the dealership, wherever they organize and have everything, um, where you can pull all the data and put it all together and issue all the various permits and so on, right? Because of the, what the data supports and the integration of that data. And if we can start with, it doesn't have to be motor vehicle, maybe something else. Right, which delivers value to people, it will create a buzz and excitement around it, which will help us in terms of getting, you know, of, of advocacy, not only advocacy, but getting broad public support for, for many of these initiatives. Yeah. Thank Great. you, Mr. Halton. Um, yeah. Any other panelists want to contribute to that question? Well, let me. me what was that Joaquin? Go ahead. Yes, I was I was going to say that, you know, I think with the pending um coming into force of our data protection legislation, um, that SMEs as MSMEs are going to have to take a real hard look at data governance, particularly when it comes to um where that data is personal data. Um, everyone actually, both public and private sector entities will have to do an assessment of what it is that you currently have in, in respect of that and how it is that you're going to comply with that piece of legislation. And I think that's a start. Um, and so my recommendation would be from a, from a data governance perspective, specifically as it relates to personal data, is that MSMEs really have to now sit down and do an assessment of what it is that they're collecting, um, what it is that they need from customers um, to drive the business that they're or the, the business that they're in and to sell the services or products that they're selling, and begin to do to ensure that there are things that are in place that will make them compliant. I think that is a good place to start because of the obligations that have been imposed and will be imposed on, 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 on all processes of personal data in respect of that legislation. And so that assessment needs to be done. How is it that, are, how, is it, how are you protecting that data? Are you collecting more, than, more data than you actually need to deliver the goods, goods or services that you're selling? You know, those kinds of conversations and internal discussions have to be had and a look has to be taken at that. So I think that that's a good place to start. If, if it is that there is any M MSME um, on, uh, listening in now and, and is mindful of, you know, but this might just be overwhelming. I say pick one. And as, as, a, as a data protection advocate, I would say 
go for the ones that will likely look at, look at the data that is likely to 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 give you more more um well, that that would require greater compliance um and 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 I, and and I would say focus now on on on, on looking at that and then the rest will come of course um Mr Hilton has spoken about how data is important and critical um to help you to make decisions in respect of your business but that's another element as well we have Linda sort of adding on to this train of thought saying this also means that the time spent by customers waiting in a queue should be recognized and valued. Also needs a plan to be adopted to reduce such delays. Each hour spent in a queue potentially represents lost revenue to the state in terms of work and value added and even the opportunity cost. So that uh, idea of convenience which Mr. Hilton had, had emphasized uh, a couple of times during his presentation, I think goes beyond the, the convenience to the customer, but it's in that idea of productivity and that uh, all the benefits that redound from bringing data together in a space where things can move faster and be more seamless and synchronized. Um, so Dr. McNaughton, any final thoughts as uh, we close the, the Q&A? So I would say I did, you know, Payne, I did have a final question for the panelists. Um, what do you think should happen next to ensure that this whole GDB study and the report and the data, you know, just doesn't become another fancy report that sits on a shelf? And I think um, Patrick articulated quite well the idea of let's pick an initiative that requires a collaboration between academia, the Mono School of Business and Management, the private sector, the public sector. Let's conceptualize an initiative. Let's pick one. Doesn't have to be that dumb rep example where you can walk into a place and walk out, drive out a car, but something that would tangibly demonstrate a partnership and a collaboration between all these key actors in the economy um, to come up with a very visible initiative. And, and Patrick, I'm going to take you up on that challenge, you know, because um, obviously we. We want to come to uh, one of the significant private sector actors that can cause people to stand up and pay attention. And that sounds like um, NCB, but we, we'll definitely conceptualize an idea because I think that's a, that's a great way to sort of feign, uh, make a lot of what is in this GDB report tangible if we can find such an initiative that uh, creates a strong value proposition for multiple actors. Um, yeah. But that would be my final word. And I will turn back over to you to bring a wrap to what has been interesting. It feels like we just scratched the surface. Um, but uh, yeah, the, there's a lot more information about the GDB and the Caribbean report. And we're actually creating a, a, a dashboard where people can interrogate the Caribbean GDB data. So we will circulate that to the participants in the next couple of days. So Wonderful. back over to you, Finn. Practice this, but I think in a way that leaves us all wanting to do more, um, to uh, manifest, as you said, that tangible um, collaboration to, to, to start to demonstrate to people what can be achieved and where we can go if we sort of synchronize and work together. And so much potential across the Caribbean uh, for, for strides to go forward, as the, the different ratings showed. Um, point taken that this is not just a, a, an end game ranking, but sort of a, a snapshot of where we are with a view to trying to get us to where we want to go. Um, hopefully this was uh, the start of continued collaboration and conversation. I wanna thank uh, the team at UE Mona School of Business and Management for bringing this together, uh, for bringing all of us and this, the different parts of the conversation together. And for of course, allowing me the opportunity to be with you all to, um, to guide you through what I hope was a memorable two hours spent together. Um, so thank you to all the participants who joined, to all our panelists and to of course the organizing team. And we look forward to reconvening after the next uh, Caribbean edition of the next global data barometer uh, comes to fruition. So we can reassess where we are in uh, another year or two's time. Thank you so much, everybody. And it was great being with you all. Have a safe evening and a great weekend ahead.